Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Deb Gray. Thank you so much, uh, Deb, for doing this. Greatly appreciate it for sitting down. Um, I, I read your book. I have it right here. I've been reading it over and over again for the last few days just to recoup myself because I've been going through some uh, uh, things in the last few days. So I've been just trying to reread it over and over again. But your book, Never Retreat, Never Explain, Never Apologize, My Life in Politics, is a unique look at the formation of the Reform Party, the Canadian Alliance, and the creation of now the Conservative Party of Canada. Um, if you haven't read it, I suggest anyone go out and get it, try to find it because it's an amazing book. Um, I'm going to start my questioning off with the same question I ask every politician. Where did your sense of duty come from? Well, I'm, I'm the fourth girl in my family and uh, we have a younger brother. So uh, I think it was instilled in me early. I was a little kid in Vancouver and uh, I think my parents, my mother especially, instilled in me duty to family and uh and that was important to me uh community was always important and i almost think you're that's a big part of it but i think a lot of it is you're kind of born with that uh you know you have this idea i asked my mother many years after i was elected if you had to pick one of your kids that would end up kind of making canadian history and being in ottawa which kid would it be and she said deborah dear no question. <laughs> it would be you. So, so maybe some of that is innate, you know, you're, you're just born with it. But uh, I think more than that, um, I, I realized that country is important. God was important in my life. And, uh, and I'm a July 1st baby. So how could you not be a proud and passionate Canadian and feel some sense of duty to your, to your home country, the land of your birth and the land of your heart, truly? You, you just spoke about your mother there, but was she political in any way? Not a bit. Was no, uh, neither my mother nor my father really were political. But my great grandfather on my dad's side was Ted Applewaite. He married my great grandmother and he was a liberal MP or, uh, you know, way, way back in the day. And uh, they got taken out by the Diefenbaker government. Uh, and he was from Prince Rupert area. So, it's almost like it was a genetic throwback, you know, a couple of generations later, I, who had no political aspirations whatsoever, zero, high school English teacher, minding my business, having a great life in northeastern Alberta, and then dared by a neighbor to run. So uh, it's not as though I, I dreamed this up as a little kid and, and carried on uh, with this as my aim and goal in life. Not at all. And in that Northeast community of Frog Lake, I know it quite well uh, from my time living in Lloydminster. Uh, I it was a uh, love for Lloydminster. It has a little uh, heart, a spot in my heart for the rest of my life. The border. What did you do in Lloyd? I was a reporter in Lloydminster at the local newspaper there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, what fun. So I, I know Frog Lake quite well because that was our readership area. So we, I would have to go out there from time to time. So how does a girl from Vancouver make her way all the way up to rural Alberta in Frog Lake? That is an excellent question. Uh, I had a couple of girlfriends who I met when we worked with Operation Mobilization, a Christian group that works overseas or well around the world. I was in Spain and uh, made friends with a couple of them and went to visit them in Edmonton on my way home to BC after I was finished uh, that summer mission. And they got, they were working, lived close to Wainwright and then got a job uh, working up in Fort Chippewa up in Northeastern Alberta. And so I went up to visit them and ended up getting a summer job up there in the summer of 77. And so uh, I just fell in love with the bush and Northern Alberta. It was wonderful. I was a young woman. I needed to transfer from where I was going at Trinity Western University and, and then got the job up there and just fell in love with it. So I transferred to University of Alberta then from Trinity Western and finished my degree and applied for a job. I got a job with Indian Affairs out at Frog Lake Reserve and finished my last exam, I think April 24th, and then went out there April 25th in 1979, started teaching and loved every minute of it. Did you learn anything about yourself living in Frog Lake? 
Well, I learned what it was like to be uh, on the flip side of the coin, that's for sure. I had always been in the majority. I mean, I was a, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant kid growing up in Vancouver. Uh, lots of uh, ethnic people there in my high school, but I, I was always part of the majority. And now all of a sudden there I was living on the reserve and uh, and part of the minority. So it gave me a really good grounding and a, a good idea uh, what it's like for people who are in a minority situation. So I taught for years uh, in Frog Lake uh, for a year and a half. I finished out that year and then the complete next year and then got a job teaching high school English, which was my specialty down in Dewberry, Alberta on the south side of the river, which is uh, if you're between Vermilion and Lloyd Minster, you just draw a triangle up to the top and there's Dewberry. So I taught there for many years. And then, uh, as I said, as a proud and passionate Canadian, July 1st baby, never politically involved at all, but having a discussion over birthday cake and coffee one night uh, when the uh, 88 election was coming up and the Reform Party was brand new. And of course, you in Alberta, you know, the name Preston Manning certainly had name recognition and I wanted to know if these guys were a bunch of, you know, Western separatist kooks, I think was my exact uh, question. They said, oh, no, my neighbor Liz said, oh, no, Preston Manning's the leader of it. And, you know, they're very reputable. And then the theme is the West wants into Canada. And I thought, well, that'd be awfully nice. So I, I went uh, into the other room when she phoned the president of the Riding Association and said, oh, here, uh, you know, Pat Churn wants to talk to you. I said, what? So she said, oh, you're thinking of becoming the candidate, are you? I said, well, hardly, but send me your platform and I'll have a look at it. And she did. And I read it and I thought, this is me. I've been a reformer since before there was reform. So that's what got me started. And uh, she said, I dare you to become the candidate. Well, you know what? What self-respecting mischievous kid would not just accept a dare, really? And so uh, it, that led to a series of events which saw me nominated as the candidate and uh, ran in 88, came a very distant fourth, and then ran again in the by-election and made Canadian history on March 13, 89, which for me is quite a while ago. And But for anybody young listening to your audience, I am like a museum piece, you know, this ancient of days, because 1989 was basically forever ago. Well, just the 80s seemed like forever ago compared to last year with 2020 and this COVID. So uh, 1989 yeah. seems like forever ago. But let's talk about that 1988 election a bit. Uh, you had no political experience. You had never been a candidate. And you put your name on the ballot. Going into that ballot box for the first time, seeing your name on the ballot, what was that like? <laughs> it was ridiculous. Uh, I, I saw my name and I thought, whoa, okay, well, they haven't spelled right. So I like that a lot because both of my names can be misspelled. And as an English teacher and just as me, I'm pretty, you know, fussy about that kind of stuff. So, but I went in and I saw my name and I'm telling you, I, I was in there a long time because I thought, no, I have to make sure I get this on the right line. So I'm going with my fingers down the line and there it is, Gray, Deborah. And I made sure that I took my fingers across the line so that I would put the X in the right spot. But it was surreal. And of course, I was in my little area of Heinsberg, you know, a small, small town, um, and which was my polling place. So, of course, I knew the returning officers. I knew everyone. And they, they said, oh, Deb, you know, you're here to vote. And as I had, you know, forever and ever, I started voting the minute I turned 18. And so uh, it just, it was a very funny feeling, but I, I thought, well, here we go. And, and I thought, I wonder how many other people are doing this, putting Deborah Gray on the X, not being nearly as careful as I was for sure to get the X in the right place. But I placed a very distant fourth. I got uh, 13 and a half percent of the vote. You needed 15% to get your deposit back. And I thought, well, I came close and I thought, well, a few thousand people voted for me. So I thought, wow, that, that was pretty cool and figured it to be an amazing, a most amazing adventure and field trip uh, because I was teaching social studies 10 that year on Canadian geography, Canadian history. Had no idea about that because I was an English teacher, but my principal asked me to teach it. And so we, I just kind of was one chapter ahead of the kids. But I thought, what an amazing field trip that was. Thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. And of course, came forth and thought, that was my political foray, uh, in and done. And little did you know, mm. literally a few days after the election, uh, the incumbent at the time who had just won the election had passed away. I, for, I apologize, I'm forgetting his name right now. Yeah, John Dahmer. 
John Dom were correct. Uh, yep. He had passed away. And the reform party calls you up that day and says, hey, you're running in the by-election, correct? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I remembered thinking, oh, my word, you know, because I, I, the election was Monday and, uh, and Ottawa was coming out to swear him in, I think, on Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, Thursday, I think, and on Wednesday, he went into a coma. In fairness to him, he got very sick very quickly. And so, uh, you know, we were, we were all sad for him. And this was a lifelong dream of his. And, uh, and he got elected, but he never even got sworn in because I think he went into a coma the night before and he died on the Saturday. So I just thought, oh, my. So, so my response to it was I found Preston Manning's phone number and called him up and said, Preston, just want to let you know that John Dahmer just died and uh, there will be a by-election and just consider me your warm-up show because it would be great if you came and ran here. So they didn't really come looking for me. I offered that because oh. guess what? I had to go back to school. Oh yeah, there's that. I had taken a six week leave. So uh, I, I was back at school already. Then after that, Preston came up and drove around unbeknownst to me, drove all around the upsides and downsides of Beaver river out to Coal Lake and up to Lac Bish and, and said, now, well, what do you think about this candidate we had here? And so they said, well, free trade was the issue, but, uh, you know, she's, she could string two or three sentences together and sound coherent. So, uh, you know, we'd be willing to give her a shot in the by-election. So that was when he came out to a meeting at Smoky Lake and asked if I would run. And so was I, I was just yes stunned. To- Sorry? Was it hard to say yes? Because I know in your book, you talk about how you, it was a drive home after that meeting with them that you you sort of were weighing the pros and cons. Because like you said, you had just taken a sabbatical from teaching. You weren't sure if they were going to let you leave again because it was so close to the last time you just <clears throat> left. But you, at the end of the drive, you talk about in your book, you, you ultimately decided, yes, I was going to. Well, because I trusted his gut instincts and I thought if here is a leader willing to step aside and his reasoning again, like Preston was always so smart saying that, you know, you could be a flagship for the party in Ottawa and I could still crisscross and travel the country, pardon me, crisscross the country and, uh, and just, you know, get, get the party more well known. And I thought, well, that actually makes sense. So uh, I, I had thought, well, uh, you know, I gave it a run and had a great campaign team. So that part was really nice. But then uh, I thought, well, what the world, you know, why not? So I did. And, and we know the rest of the story. That that moment of the by-election is called. You now have to run. You talk about it. And it is an open secret that sometimes in the 80s and the 90s, the real uh, election was the nomination for the Conservative Party, it, whether yeah. it be the Progressive Conservatives, whether it be the Progressive Conservative uh, Association of Alberta. So you went to that nomination meeting. <laughs> I laughed my butt off when I read that because that is ballsy moves on your part to say, you know what, I'm going to go in, I'm going to go into the the, uh, ter- the uh, uh, opposition territory and just <laughs> Let me the constituents of the 4,500 who were attending that meeting. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I was too naive or too stupid or too brave or, or whatever, but, uh, I, you know, I had figured it out enough and I have always loved people. And so I just thought, might as well go where the people are. You know, who, who cares why they're there? It was bitterly cold. It was just freezing. And we went to the Glendon community center where the ice rink, I forget, it was just huge. There were, I think you're 4,500 people. And I went in there and we got a bunch of pamphlets made up that said, if you're not happy with your choice of, of nominated candidate today, maybe you'd like to consider me with my cheery little face on it saying vote Deb Gray. And I went in there and of course these things go for hours. I mean, I don't know how many ballots it went. So I found a whole bunch of kids and my, my riding association supporters were there outside. And so we, we just pasted every windshield on that bitterly cold day with this pamphlet with my cheery little face on it. And, uh, and for years, I had people say, uh, I voted for you only because I went out of that hall that day. And I, I saw that you were nervy enough to come and do that. And so they became some of my greatest supporters. But the best part about being in that hall was that, you know, they were giving the speeches and uh, Don Mazankowski was there. That was his old territory. And I really liked Maz and just want to pay tribute to him. 
yeah. you know, he, he was our uh, deputy prime minister and, uh, and I enjoyed my visits with him uh, much. So in later years, I mean, he took it hard, you know, that I kind of took over his territory at the beginning, but um, he, he just lived a great and honorable life. And so I want to pay tribute to him right now, but he wasn't very happy that day, I must say. And so I was standing in the crowd and, and, and they said, okay, we want to announce today that another candidate has come here today to see how a real party conducts a nomination meeting. And so, I mean, I, I had met a few hundred people and I was wandering around, but wasn't as recognizable as I was a year later, obviously. And so somebody in front of me just said, just went boing on their head like this and said, why did they announce to everybody that Deb Gray is here? So I tapped him on the shoulder and say, uh, I said, I don't know why, but I sure appreciate the publicity. And he turned around and looked at me just ah, like that. It was just hilarious. So anyway, that, that was, uh, I thought that was just great fun. That, that election, as you, as we've talked about a bit so far, uh, you were the successful candidate. You won that moment of winning, seeing that check mark. Well, because oh. it wasn't televised, uh, you didn't get that check mark that you would have got during an actual election, but that announcement during that Edmonton Oilers game, yep. when you, uh, the reform make history by taking uh, Beaver river. What was that like for you? Uh, uh, it, it just, it just almost freezes you right in your tracks. Uh, you know, we, we knew that we were giving it a great run. I had no idea I was going to win. You know, we just, we just campaigned flat out. It was cold. The by-election was in March. So we'd been campaigning all fall for the November election and now all winter. I mean, I was out there, I had, you know, all kinds of lawn signs and posts and stuff. I was banging them into snow banks with my ax and uh, just traveling around and you, you work your little heart out. I mean, I played crib to kill and scrabble to kill. I am very competitive. I don't mind losing, but I'll tell you, I play to win. And so, uh, you know, I, I went out there with full gusto, just, just planning to win this thing, but still no idea that we were actually going to. That's a pretty big hill to climb. And so uh, on election night, when the results started coming in, I just, I said to my campaign team, oh my. And all these media people came to St. Paul, Alberta. You know, I recognized some of them and, and thought, oh dear, why are these guys here? And they said, well, we, we think you're going to win. I said, really? <laughs> really? You know, trying to be cool all the while, right? But really? And, uh, and so it was very interesting when it started coming in. We took 50% of the vote and made Canadian history that night. And, and there's that stark terror, like my life just turned upside down. But that unbelievable exhilaration to say, wow. My life did just turn upside down and I'm ready for this next chapter, Lord, whatever it's going to be, I'm going to hang on and just celebrate every moment of it. Was there a moment during that by-election that you looked at yourself and said, I'm going to do this. This is, this is, this is, a, this is a major possibility. Or were you being optimistic? Because you say you're a very competitive person. You're, 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 you're playing to win, but politics, politics is a, uh, it, like a week in politics could be forever, right? Yeah. So was there a moment in that campaign when you looked at yourself or someone looked at you and said, you're going to win this before that election night? Uh, nope. Really? So we all worked hard and we, we said, we're going to give it our best shot and we would cheer each other. I had the most marvelous campaign teams uh, in, in all my elections. They were just great. They loved me. I loved them. We are still friends. Many of us today, you know, this many decades later. And, uh, and so uh, it, it it was only on election night when some of those national media people came in and said, we think you have a shot at this. So that's not a lot of preparation time to get ready for your life to turn upside down, really. Yeah. Plus, I was teaching most of that time. I mean, my board w was not really happy about this. They were all Mazankowski supporters. And then this pop, you know, rises up talking about the reform party. So they were not amused. And so I just kept teaching all day and then driving around Beaver River, oh, huge, uh, all night, every night, campaigning. The moment, uh, being sworn as an MP has not come to a lot of Canadians. It's been uh, handed out to a handful. You are one of the lucky ones that uh, were, was uh, elected as an MP. Um, in your book, you talk about this, and I found it so fascinating that uh, other parties would call you up after the election or the by-election 
the MP for Edmonton East, if I'm not mistaken, Ross Harvey, the NDP, oh, yes. uh, a liberal MP from, if I'm not mistaken, Ontario or Quebec called you up, your seatmate at the time, or soon to be seatmate, said, we will introduce you because yeah. you're a new MP. Was that an olive branch for you to, to hear other parties being willing to come out of the woodworks and say, hey, we might disagree on issues, but as a parliamentary, as an MP, we're family, and I'll introduce you to the speaker if you want. Yeah, very nice. Of course, I had no idea how Ottawa ran. I mean, who knows what an MP does? Yeah. Uh, I had never called an MP's office before. Uh, I didn't know really what the job description was. But, but when they reached out to me, I just thought, that's pretty decent. And, and for me, that's what you do. You know? And so I wasn't all that surprised because I figured that's what every political party would do, you know, to be kind to the newcomer. Little did I know that, you know, how vicious it can be. But I did really appreciate that, that they, they walked me into the chambers and up the aisle and, and introduced me to the speaker, which was really kind to them. And I always appreciated that, uh, you know, throughout my political career. And if we do a fast forward to the next election in 93, when Elsie Wayne and Jean Charest uh, got elected and the Tories were just massacred to only two people. Um, I said to my caucus then, I actually got a caucus in 93. And I said, you guys, let me tell you something. I am the Dan mother now, and we need to be very kind and charitable and hospitable to these people. Cause it is no fun. If you're less than 12 people, um, in your party, you get treated as an independent. And so, uh, they had no resources, no nothing. And so that was a good lesson for me to learn that day, you know, to be able to reach out across the aisle too in later years. Um, stepping on the floor of the House of Commons for the first time well, is uh, an overwhelming experience, especially for someone like yourself who had said politics doesn't run, it didn't run in your blood and it was a new experience of what an MP does. But you talk about in your book how you, you you were scared. You were scared walking on that floor. You were nervous at first because it was an overwhelming experience. Um, in your time in politics, did that did that nervousness of walking on that floor with all the weight of Canadians, problems, issues, uh, needs ever go away? Or did you always have that in your back of your head that I'm here to serve the people and I'm only here because of the people? Yeah, exactly. Anyone who thinks that your boss is in Ottawa is sadly mistaken and probably doomed to a fairly short political life. But uh, the, the, the nervousness about actually walking onto the floor or speaking in the House of Commons, some of that goes away because, uh, you know, you spend a whole lot of time in there. But that overwhelming sense of duty, as you referred to earlier, or commitment um, and responsibility to the people, that always... Uh, that weighs on your heart. Uh, because if you realize that you're there and you always keep it in mind that you're there for the right reasons, it, it is daunting for sure. Um, walking into the chambers my first day with those two other guys, which I appreciated, uh, was my first introduction to the house. And, but ever after that, you know, there's a, there's a, a foyer that you walk into before uh, the chambers, and there was a, a bust, I sat on the opposition side, obviously, and there was a bust of Agnes McPhail uh, in that lobby, which was very cool, because she was the first w woman MP ever uh, elected, and I used to just tap her on the head every day, every day for the 15 and a half years I was there, was there and I would just tap her on the head and say, hi, and then, and then just walk in, and anyone who sat in the house with me that would watch me walk in every single day, I patted her on the head, and, uh, and just thought, thanks, because um, she, she did some pretty amazing things and got us, you know, a lot in big measure where we are today. I was woman number 40 of 295 MPs at the time. So not many of us, but um, some of the women were kind of, I mean, I, somebody asked me on an interview, what's it like being a woman in parliament? I said, well, how would I know? Because I've never been anything else but a woman. I mean, you, you think, what a stupid question. You know, I just, I'm just Deb. And, uh, and I happen to be a woman. And so I think that, you know, uh, my message to anybody listening today or tomorrow or any other day is you, you, you're a person and you want to be recognized or voted on because of merit and you have some capabilities, not because you're a woman. 
I used to laugh with Preston all the time and saying, you know, if he ever introduced me to anybody and said, I'd like you to vote for Deborah Gray because she's a woman, I said, mighty quickly, he would see my South End going north. Well, you just opened up a good point, and I want to I want to ask you this question because um, it seems today and uh, that politics uh, p- uh, political parties have a quota that they want to meet for women or minority groups that they hey we have fifty women running for our party we have forty nine uh, uh, LGBT members running for our party we have forty nine African Americans running for our party but if you look at the ridings that they're running in they're not really typical safe havens for those parties. So do you think that, uh, like you just said, it shouldn't matter if you're male or female or gay or straight or black or white, because at the end of the day, it's the person who has the best ideas. Exactly. And so, uh, you know, as soon as you start with a quota system yeah. of, of any kind, where does it end? Yeah. Where does it end? And so uh, I, I don't like um, even thinking about where that trail may lead, because if you if you happen to be black or white, um, male or female, straight or gay, I'm left-handed. You know, do I start begging special rights for left-handed people now? Anyone who's left-handed who has to go to a university lecture hall, they make a dive for about the six left-handed seats down in the in the theater for that. So, I mean, that's a very small point, but it it lets you know what I think about. Where does this trail end? And so I, I would agree you, wholeheartedly on that. Yeah, you, you can't say to me, okay, we're putting all these people uh, of all these different categories. And as you say, they put them in seats. They don't have a hope of winning. And so, uh, you know, I find that kind of cheesy, actually. Never believed in it. Eh, probably never will. Okay. We're on the same page on that one. So that's good. Um, my next set of questions is... Um, being that first reform MP, uh, sometimes in politics, the strongest voice can come from one person. The one person can make a difference in politics. As a newly elected MP in 1989, uh, the first reform MP, did you think that your voice carried weight in Ottawa or because the uh, Mulroney Tories at the time, Campbell Tories in 93, had a majority government, they didn't care what uh, the opposition thought? Well, they had a pretty significant majority for sure. And free trade was the issue, of course, in 88. But uh, I remember um, they, they were not very happy uh, with me, but they thought I was just some funny blip, you know, on the, some Western Canadian, whatever. The hilarious part to me was that, that reform was branded as a bunch of old white haired guys, you know, that were squawking. And then I show up at age 36 quite clearly a female and they're going, whoa, that sort of blew our stereotype out of the water. <clears throat> so it, it was interesting because the more that reform grew and looked to be a bit of a threat, then they started getting nervous. And of course, then when you get nervous, you get nasty, right? Yeah. So, and I thought, oh, I could wear that as a badge of honor because if, if you're not having any impact, then what do they care? They don't give a sweet fig really what you're doing. So I thought, oh, this, this must be a good sign that were uh, gaining some traction here because they were really nasty, but not just the Tories. I mean, every, everybody was nasty, which is kind of sad. The, um, the 1993 election is called. Uh, Kim Campbell uh, is the leader of the uh, Conservative Party. They're not doing as well as they expect in the polls. The Liberal Party led by John Crutchen and the Reform Party led by uh, Preston Manning, your leader and uh, as your deputy leader. Um, going into that election, what was the hope for you guys? Is to form government or was it to at least have a say in government or hold the parties to a minority government? What was the strategic plan to that? We were hoping at least to be official opposition status in 93 because the party had grown enough and we had broadened our base uh, to run candidates in the East. And so we were, or I was, I should say, uh, at least hoping for uh, official opposition status. And that was the election, of course, where the bloc got 54 seats and we got 52. So there's a bunch of separatists serving as Her Majesty's loyal official opposition. Go figure. Anyway. And I uh, want to talk we, about that because you mentioned that in the book, when Lucien Bouchard left the PCs, you were his seatmate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had the big battle over Meech Lake. And, uh, and so Mulroney just, you know, gave him the worst fate possible. He threw him over on the opposition side up to the back row where I sat. 
to sit beside Deborah Gray. And, uh, you know, we got on just fine. I, I did say to him, you know, when he first came over, I just need to let you know, because you know that I'm pretty upfront. And if I have something to say, I'm going to say it. And so I said, uh, you know, there's that little red flag on the corner of your check, you know, a federal check. That's a Canadian flag. And you are decrying Canada. So I just want to let you know that I think you should not only just walk up this aisle and stop at our seat. You ought to keep going right through the curtains, right out the lobby and right out because you don't believe in Canada. And so you're collecting a paycheck. So I said, I find that just a little bit much. But anyway, uh, you know, if you decide uh, you're sitting here anyway, and if you don't leave, then we'll be seatmates, I guess. And so we were. And we got on just fine, although I, I totally disagreed with why he was there for sure. That and uh, like you said, you were two sheets, two seats shy away from being uh, official opposition. Was there any talk of taking those two PC M MPs and saying, "Hey, join with us. Let's form a coalition so the official opposition is not a separatist movement"? Oh, well, yeah, I'm sure there were discussions. Uh, you know, I I knew that they because people were asking me, of course, when I was elected as a reformer. I mean, this is ridiculous you sitting here by your side, you know, I got all kinds of invitations to cross the floor, but I didn't want to do that. And, and, and I respected that with Elsie and, and Jean Charest. And so it, I don't think there was ever anything official, um, you know, about collecting people in just for the sake of collecting them in to be official opposition. So we, we served the best way we could, but not that I'm aware. I certainly didn't make any uh, overtures to say, uh, you know, I mean, I, I had a bit of a history with Jean Charest anyway. He, when I first got elected, he said, oh, she's going to be sitting up in the nosebleed section. <laughs> and, and so, of course, I said, when the press came trotting over to me saying, oh, what do you think about that? I said, the nosebleed section in the House of Commons is still a pretty cool place to sit. Not many Canadians have sat there. And then what do you know the next election? Where did Jean end up? Oh, dear, dear. It, it comes back and bites you. Certainly does. Um, during that uh, first two years, as the uh, as a larger caucus of fifty two members, uh, Canada was thrust into a national, uh, I would say, nightmare crisis of Quebec wanting to separate. You talk about it in your book, uh, but I want to let I want I want to hear from you as a MP for Alberta at the time. What was it like to be in the center of the? political uh, universe of Canada and seeing a province of Canada wanting to separate? Well, it, it was horrible. <clears throat> and they came just that close. I mean, I remember back in 1970, I was graduating from high school and living through all that. And then again, um, I didn't think Chrétien was showing real leadership, uh, you know, about uh, making sure that how strong Canada was and what a great place it was to be. So they, they came, um, hanging on the precipice. Uh, I think the vote was 50.1 to 49.9, you know, something ridiculous. Yeah. And so uh, they came awfully close, but uh, I think again, that has waned in, in years since then, but it was a, a really nervous and trying time <clears throat> to be in the house and in Ottawa, seeing that this might really come to pass. And so, uh, yeah, they, they were hard days. And I remember, um, I got uh, our caucus together. I was the caucus chairman. And, and in our big caucus room, we, I got some big, huge TVs in to, uh, you know, to watch the results. We all watched them together. And you're, you're just hanging on a cliff thinking, yikes, you know, Canada, as I know it, is it about to finish? But it, again, for people listening today, that's ancient history, you know, when, when that happened. So, but I'm, I'm glad it didn't. And I, I think it, shook Chrétien pretty well to his core as well, because he was a Quebecer as well. So, But anyway, I'm glad it didn't go through. Um, you, you, the 52 seats that you had in 93, uh, an election is called as mandated in 1997. Uh, you grow your party by three uh, seats. Uh, at this time, uh, you, you go back to that original statement of you saying when you met with your first EDA of... Uh, the Reform Party, the West wants in. Did, did the West get in between 93 and 97 with only 60 ML MPs? Uh, we went from 52 seats. To 52, 52, sorry. Yeah, we, we gained eight. Yeah, and uh, we felt more 
like we were getting in, we were official opposition, then that was great. But I, I think it was only years ahead when Stephen Harper became prime minister in 06 uh, that, you know, that we really said the West is in. So uh, we, we were making gains and we, and we appreciated that. But um, I, I don't know. I think we probably would still say the West wants in back then. Ooh, especially back today. <laughs> yeah. Um, looking back on your career, on your life in politics, um, did you get what you needed accomplished? Oh, my. Well, I... Because you were there from 89 to 2004, yeah. a long career. Did you get what you needed to get accomplished? Were you, are you happy with how <laughs> things turned out? Well, I had a remarkable career and a great run. You know, I still, I still get uh, emails from people saying, wow, I just got an email this morning of all things from some woman who said, uh, you know, we, you and my mom were a big influence on me. And my mom was a director in Ontario when reform started way, way back. Wow. I mean, this, we're talking, you know, almost 30 years ago. So that was very cool. I love that. So people still are, are contacting me. And I think that that's really neat. If there's anything more that I would have, could have, should have done, was uh, we still don't have an elected Senate in Canada. And, I, you know, nothing is ever going to change until you have equal representation in the Senate that you do in the House of Commons, because Ontario and Quebec are so big. So we have six senators each. They have 24 senators each. And I taught English, not math, but I can even figure that out, you know, that nothing's going to change. So, but, but I mean, we worked our hearts out on that, and I gave it my all uh, to do a Triple E Senate. But um, if I could have done anything more... It would have been just to go in there like the grade eight school teacher and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to have an elected Senate, but of course it doesn't work that way, but I tried. I have no regrets. You have one of the honors of being uh, her majesty's official opposition leader from May, <laughs> May 2000 to or March 2000 to September yes. 2000. Yeah. Um, what was that like being the leader of the official opposition during the time of transition between Preston Manning and Stockwell to, well, it was, uh, you know, it was fascinating. And I guess, I mean, I didn't want the position. Everyone said, oh, Deb, you should run, you know, as leader, you should do this. But I, I wanted to be on the team. Uh, I had been the den mother, as I mentioned earlier, and the, uh, the caucus chairman for a very long time at that point. But um, it, it just seemed to be kind of the next natural thing to do. And, uh, and I was able to hold the team together while we went through a leadership race. And so that part was great. But I remember just being in there and thinking, whoa, I thought I was busy before, you know, it just, then, then you're just on all the time, all the time. But uh, I was able to serve in that role. And of course the press came trotting in, uh, you know, all the time saying, whoa, look at this, you know, this is a bit, I mean, it was historic. And so it was kind of exciting, but at the same time, I kind of made it fun by saying, well, here you go, guys. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to see something now that you've never seen the leader of the opposition do. And I put my lipstick on in front of them. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I can't be sure that no leader of the opposition ever did that since Confederation, but, but uh, I know I did as a woman put my lipstick on. And so they got their film clip for the day and they went away happy. Um, there's a quote in your book and you, you say you live by it. and I want to read it out. Never retreat, never explain, never apologize, get the things done and let them howl. This is, of course, a quote by Nellie McClung, a reformer, legislature, legis legislator, author, and one of the famous fives. You say in your book yet again, this is how I've lived my life. I've never backed away from nor regretted apologizing when I've been wrong. However, when on the right path, it is possible to get sidetracked by the naysayers. Then it is essential to never retreat, never explain, never apologize. Do you still live by those words? Hundred percent. What do yeah. they mean to you today? They they mean to me today something obviously different because I'm I'm semi retired. I still do some speaking, sit on a board of the camp that I went to when I was a kid growing up, and uh, it's important though. Although my life is much quieter and far more peaceful, plus this COVID year is just so hard on everybody. But uh, uh, you, you just, we talk about things forever. And I just think, no, let's just quit yapping. Let's actually do something and get it done. So that's important to me. If we're going to talk about doing a project, you could put it off forever, get a committee, do this, do that. But no, I just, I just think it's important to actually get stuff done. And, uh, and if someone else doesn't like it, I just think, oh, well, 
there it is, you know, get over it. And so uh, I think probably my husband, my closest friends, my family would all say, yep, that's Deb. Just get it done. So uh, Nellie McClung was good. Were they perfect? No. I mean, there were all kinds of things that went on back in the day that was that was part of their times. But I still think we need to learn from the good parts of that history. And I appreciate what she said. And I think that uh, adage is as true today as it was way back when. My last question before you wrap up here, Deb. Um, looking back on your life, how do you want to be remembered? I'd like to be remembered as somebody who did actually get it done. Somebody who uh, lived her life optimistic always as a woman of faith, because my life is not in my hands. It's in God's hands. And uh, that I was obedient to the calling I was given and that I had one ton of fun along the way. Awesome. Um, the Honorable Deborah Gray, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I, I, again, I have to say to the, my listeners, go out, find Never Retreat, Never Explain, Never Apologize, My Life and My Politics by Deborah Gray. It is an amazing read. I, I recommend it to anyone. Deborah, I want to thank you once again for doing this. Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Bye-bye.